Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. And uh, thank you to Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. One of the few organizations whose long, when you say the name in full, it's easier than using the abbreviation. <laughs> you know this? So, um, and thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I know it's very windy outside tonight. It's one of the few things we actually can't blame on Robert Moses. <laughs> but maybe we'll try. Maybe we'll try. Listen, so tonight we're going to talk about three things, really. First, we're going to talk about the city. We're going to talk about the city and we're going to talk about democracy. And the third element that we're going to talk about tonight is power. So like everyone else in studying cities, democracy, and power, we center our conversation on Robert Moses. But I want to begin tonight by making something very, very clear. There's a movement afoot right now. There are people who say, oh, you know, he got a lot built. He got a lot done. And if you feel that way, that there should be a rose-colored lens with which we think of and consider Robert Moses, perhaps you should go home and watch Netflix tonight. <laughs> this is not the place where you should be. You know, but we're also going to look at larger issues tonight. Because in many ways, Moses reminds us of how fragile our very democracy is. And at this time and the world we're living in today, in many ways, the story we're going to retell tonight is a canary in the coal mine about our own democracy and our own future in this country. So like any young urban planner, I read The Power Broker. Many of you probably did as well. And I figured 700,000 words, it's got to cover everything, right? In fact, the, the initial version that, that Caro turned in was a million words, but they couldn't, they couldn't bind it. <laughs> the technology didn't exist, and they weren't going to do two volumes. So they cut out uh, 300,000 words. I, I have my copy here, and I want to have um, this is some audience participation for a moment, if this will work. OK. In the first row, can you do me a quick favor? Go to the index and tell me what page Jane Jacobs appears. <laughs> Sorry. Let's just have her glasses on. Well, it's okay. I'll cut to the chase. So as some of you know, Jane Jacobs does not appear in 700,000 words about urban planning in the 20th century of New York. So really, the truth is that no one book, no one can tell the full story here. Um, but in those 700,000 words, what is missed is the element of, of course, Jane Jacobs, born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You know, a lot of times you'll hear things like this. Jane Jacobs, comma, what comes after the comma? Housewife. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. I wish I had like awards to throw out. Jane Jacobs, comma, a housewife. Let's clear up something from the onset tonight. Jane Jacobs, well, I mean, she had, she had children, it's true, but Jane Jacobs was a writer, she was a reporter, she worked at Architectural Forum, she writes an article that puts her on the map initially in 1958 about the folly of the coming Lincoln Center. And the publisher of Fortune magazine was said to have said, who is this crazy dame who would dare criticize Lincoln Center? Misogyny would follow her in her, in her whole career. But the challenge that we have tonight is some people say, you know what? We all know this. Jane Jacobs was right. We have awards named after her. We have books. We have movies. She's run the gamut. But it's another thing to say that Jane Jacobs has won. And in many ways, that's more important. Because urban planning isn't like law, where we have precedent that's set, like Marbury versus Madison, Brown versus Board. It's always evolving. And what it comes down to is the city, our democracy, and our power structure. For example, you're telling me Jane Jacobs has won. I'll show you buildings that have shadows that cast on Central Park. How is that Jane Jacobs winning? You tell me Jane Jacobs won, I'll show you mass transit that's literally crumbling before our very eyes. I'll show you public housing that's crumbling before our very eyes. We can argue about how our elected officials have failed us, and how, but in my opinion, Robert Moses is the original sin. <laughs> and in many ways, we're still paying the devil his due, except today, they say, well, if you build it, you're making progress. But the question is, what kind of progress are we making? We see this in the quotes from elected officials today. It's actually quite astonishing. At least he got it built. And that's what we need today, a real commitment to getting things done. Elliot Spitzer said that. A member of the, 
Well, <laughs> consider the source, right? Let's get another one. A member of the Port Authority said this, and this is, this is said just a few years ago. Would Robert Moses succeed today? Of course he would. He was a brilliant builder and a leader accustomed to wielding power creatively. Creatively, I would put in quotes, by the way, but Moses would understand the intricacies of today's rules and use substantive intellect to manipula manipulate and stretch the law to his own purposes. And it's true, but he means this in a good way. <laughs> How about this beauty? He was a man whose power emanated not only from his significant personal skills, but from his phenomenal level of accomplishment. While many today have criticized him for his authoritative methods and management and conducting business, its focus on automobile-supported transportation and perceived, perceived insensitivity to communities and culture, no one can question the permanent impact he's had on the framework and infrastructure of New York State. Again, we're talking tonight about the city. We're talking tonight about the eight million people that live in the city. We're talking about democracy. We're talking about the elected officials who supposedly represent our interests. Exactly. <laughs> but we're also talking about power and the power that's supposed to vest in all of us. Now, when it, that power breaks down, it causes tremendous harm. Here's, here's how great public works are supposed to work. They don't send people out they bring people into the city. There's this term that they use for highways. They're called alt uh, arterial roads. The very name tells you their intent. An artery takes blood, oxygenated blood away from the heart. What real public planning, what real public works do is they're not arteries, they're veins. They're veins that return the lifeblood to the city. And let me show you an example of what I mean. We're gonna begin our story tonight in 1825. Why 1825? Well, some millennials think that's when Facebook was founded. <laughs> Not the case. It begins with this man. Anyone know who this is? DeWitt Clinton. DeWitt Clinton. Very good. So the Erie Canal is where we're going with this. So in 1820, New York has a population of 123,000, which is a large city for the time. Philadelphia and Boston are close by. But Clinton proposes this. This is the Erie Canal, and uh, 1825 proposes a system where goods can be shipped up the canal, up the Hudson River, and then across the, country, uh, across the state. And then once they get to the Great Lakes, can be shipped down the Mississippi and Ohio rivers as a form of commerce and transportation. Now, this is before the railroad, and so there's no efficient way to get goods and services across the country. It costs $7.13 million or so. And at the time, Everyone says, no, well, you can't do this. This is a waste of money. They called it Clinton's Ditch. The canal opens in 1825. Before the canal opened, if you were to ship goods across the country, for $125 per ton, it would take 45 days. After the canal, for these same goods, instead of $125 per ton, it's $6 per ton, and it's nine days. And so what happens when you create such a public work. The economy booms here. New York becomes the center for transportation, for living, for business, because you've reduced cost and you've created these huge efficiencies. So by 1860, 40 years later, the population of New York rises to 1.1 million. An incredible boom. And all of a sudden, New York is in the center of this new emerging country. A few years later, in 1873, about right here, my handy pointer can show, an immigrant, the son of an immigrant was born, who then would go on to help us shape our story tonight. This is Al Smith. So Al Smith's born on uh, 174th South Street. He lives in Lower East Side. He never had education above high school. Because he comes from the immigrant community, he has a very different approach than our elected officials of the day or even today. And Al Smith reminds us of how important immigrants are to America. Because he lived it. When he was 13, his father died and his mother had to go to the funeral in the morning and then had to go to work in the afternoon because there were no laws of protection. She didn't want to lose her job. She would have been fired. So Al Smith becomes a Tammany man. He has this big, booming voice. And they make him an assemblyman. He didn't want to be an assemblyman. But at the time, that's sort of how the world worked. 
hated Albany, but he read the bills. He read the bills because the bills in Albany mattered because they impacted people like his family and the people of the Lower Fourth Ward who were, uh, who were harmed. Fate intervened on March of 1911. Exactly, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire breaks out. 145 women are killed. Uh, 146 women are killed, actually, and they were making $7 a week, which is the equivalent of about $3.20 an hour. Now, Al Smith co-heads a commission, and the commission looks at reforms that could happen as a result of this terrible fire, and he investigates this, and he creates all these series of reforms, and all of a sudden, Al Smith grows and grows in stature. Eventually, he becomes the speaker, he becomes the governor, and he becomes the first son of an, uh, son of an immigrant here to run for president. And if you're sitting up close, you can see down below that those were license plates that they had as part of his campaign for president. You can kind of see them below. I met Al Smith's great-great-grandson a few years back, and he heard parts of this talk, and he sent me as a gift. This actually was Al Smith's license plate, which, if you'd like to see it later, is pretty... You should probably have it in a museum or at least use gloves instead of just throwing it up here. But uh, if you'd like to see it later, uh, feel free to come by. It was a, a very nice gift. But the reason we talk about Al Smith tonight is because Al Smith had two aides that go on to shape the 20th century. The first is Governor and then President Roosevelt, and the second is Robert Moses. It, it's funny because Moses enters public life as a reformer. He first comes to City Hall with his grading system and says, we're going to grade everyone in city government. We're going to give them an A, a B, or whatever. And if they don't hold their job well, we're going to let them go. Great. Except Tammany Hall didn't like that, and they threw him, out of, threw him out. He couldn't get a job for a while, and he missed his opportunity, but he wasn't going to, he was going to change his ways on his second time around. And young Robert Moses was a man in a hurry, and when, when Al Smith became governor, Robert Moses was very influential, and Moses wanted to do something very big. Al Smith said, there must be something, there must be something, and finally Moses one day realized there was something he could do, and that was Parks. Robert Moses starts by creating Parks, the New York State Council of Parks. This is Jones Beach. You have to remember, in 1929, there's no such thing as a beach for the masses. Beaches were for the 1% of the 1%. Beaches on Long Island were even for the 1% of the 1% of the 1% because you had these extremely <coughs> large estates. No one had access to this. In fact, Jones Beach was, a, was only two feet above water, so it would constantly flood. He raised it to 12 feet. There were, it was terrible wind, so he brought in dunes that protected it from the, from the water. I mean, any obstacle he overcame, he used the most expensive materials of the day, materials that you would never use in public works, and what happens is it's an amazing triumph for those who can get there. And we'll get to that in a moment. But these materials were never used before, and people were awed not only of the park, but of the man who could figure out a way to build this. There's Moses on the beach. He was an avid swimmer. Year after year after year, summer after summer, Jones Beach becomes more and more popular. This was on opening day, the photo. When I showed this to my daughter, who's seven years old, said, how'd you find your car? <laughs> It's like, what do you do? <laughs> the other thing that's not, has not changed over time is this, the traffic. Now, the one other feature, if you look very, very, very closely in the photos that we just put up there, all of the folks that were in those pictures are white. So Long Island in 1920s, 1930s is a blank canvas. You're not working around buildings or even really people aside from estates. There is no need to make the overpasses on the Meadowbrook Parkway low. Why? Well, Moses had a reason. And the reason is that at the time, most African Americans didn't own automobiles. And to prevent them from coming to the beach, he prevented buses from getting access to the beach. This is what happens when the people who are responsible for planning our cities are racist. And Moses' racism comes out time and time again during his years in power. We'll fast forward a little bit to 19, the 1930s, where we have three great storm clouds are approaching New York. The first, of course, is the Great Depression. The second is corruption. And the third, equally negative force, is the rise of modernist planning. 
The depression was hard everywhere in the country, but it's particularly hard here in New York where we had the financial capital. And the struggles of the depression were enormous here in the city, 27% unemployment, I mean, figures we can't imagine today. When I first did this lecture back in 2007, one of my students at John Jay College aptly noted that even the dog is white. <laughs> There's no way like the American way, for those who can't see. At the same time, New York is awash in, awash in corruption. Our very charming, a very dazzling mayor, <clears throat> Jimmy Walker, who ran a casino in Central Park, amongst other things, uh, made sure that whatever money was coming into the city went to his friends and not to the proper city coffers. But so charming was he at his corruption trial that the prosecutor was told, don't look him in the eye because he'll charm the pants off of you. And so sure enough, when Walker was brought to the stand, the prosecutor over here stood sideways to not look him in the eye. <laughs> True story. So out of Walker's administration comes Fiorello LaGuardia, who will then come to dominate much of our politics for many years forward. And we have at the time a friendly, uh, friendly new president uh, in Washington, and this sets the stage for Robert Moses. So Moses comes to New York in 1932, and he's appointed the chairman of the Triborough Bridge Authority. And this is where the story begins to take a dark turn, because Moses uses Triborough for his own purposes. These are photos of the construction of the bridge. It's a massive undertaking. It, it, they tried since 1916 to build the bridge. They couldn't build the bridge. There were over a million man hours that go into making it. A whole forest in the Pacific Northwest had to be torn down to make the, the, the uh, foam works for the concrete. Moses tried to save some money, so in 1935 he signed a contract for have steel to be imported from Germany. He just, you know, the price was right. The contract was canceled by LaGuardia, who said, and I'll quote, the only commodity we get from Hitler land is hatred. In the end, the project was so expensive that it cost more than the construction of the Hoover Dam. However, Moses uses Triborough as the centerpiece of power because what no one read in the bill about creating the authority is that the chairman has the ability to renew all of its bonds. The chairman collects the money and spends it at his will. So suddenly, as the chair of this public authority, which doesn't have to show their books to the public, Moses has now his own revenue stream, and he uses it for his own, his own advantage. He doesn't just create a revenue stream. They have their own police force. They have their own communications network. They have their own flag. They have their own island called Randall's Island. Literally a government onto themselves, Moses creates here. And after that, he's really off to the races. This is a, a photo of opening day. And if you've ever been on the Triborough Bridge, there's just something I want to point out. Uh, I'm going to call it Triborough, not RFK, if that's all right, by the way. I, I still just call it Triborough. <laughs> So the most curious thing about the bridge is you're connecting Manhattan, the Bronx, and Queens, right? Now, the bridge from here seems to make a whole lot more sense if it just goes from here, right? So every time you take the two-mile trip up and the two-mile trip down, you can thank Robert Moses for that. William Randolph Hearst owned land over here. He wanted the city to take it over for the bridge. And Moses knew a thing or two about power and who to not upset, and you don't mess with William Randolph Hearst. So they condemned the land here. They bought the land paying a premium to Hearst, which made him very happy, which made Robert Moses' coverage in his papers very positive. And now instead, when you're taking the FDR, you drive two miles up and two miles down, and the bridge should just go right here. But the third storm cloud to come to New York is modernist planning. This is Le Corbusier, who hates New York, hates disorder, and believes in order symmetry, straight lines, modernist planning. This is best on display at the 1939 World's Fair. This is called Futurama before Disney World. It's like Disney World before Disney World. And so at Futurama, you sat in one of these chairs and you go around the circle and they're showing you the future with the city of tomorrow. And here is what the modernists thought was the city of tomorrow. Just take a look for a moment. These very wide highways, no traffic, no people, I want to point out. No people. No one noticed that at the time. Uh, this was the idea that highways go through cities. 
without much consideration for the city that's actually there. And you could argue that Robert Moses is the greatest student of Le Corbusier's vision, which he twists. But this is where the modernists think the future is. Of course, at the onset of World War II, construction in New York does slow down. But then in 1945, he just passed away, by the way. Yeah. 1945, that ends. Big about that photo actually in the Times today. There you go. Well, well timed that. I just put that in. <laughs> um, you see this cross section of Americans getting together to celebrate. And I just zoomed in randomly on one. You see all these very hopeful faces with the war now coming to an end. The boys coming home, and New York becomes this center of the world in ways that were never before possible. Like when you think about cities, you think about, you know, Berlin, London, Paris, these are all capital cities. New York, we're not even the capital of the state. <laughs> so the city takes on this really new form, which is the capital of the world. And we're set for glory. So the next 30, 40, 50 years, we should not just be competing with our contemporaries, but New York should be a modern day Athens, a modern day Egypt. And this is what New York becomes going forward. We become the city of this, and the city of this, and this, 35 years later from that last photo I just showed you. The destruction that came over that 35, 40 year period is unbelievable culminating in many ways with Ford telling the city to drop dead. Some of you may remember the Fear City advertisements. You can kind of see this a little bit. Don't go out after 6 p.m. How scary it is to be out. The crime statistics are terrible. President Carter visited Charlotte Street in the Bronx, a street that became so devastated they took it off the city map. There it's the, the president with Mayor Beam literally removed from the map and looking completely bombed out. And so to understand what happens in that 30 to 40 year period, we have to learn who was in power and who made the decisions that led to all of these problems. And that <laughs> takes us back to Moses. Key point, Robert Moses is never elected to office and we all know that, but the reason that's so important is if you're putting a highway through a community you complain to your elected officials and they fight it and they care about that because elected officials care about voters, at least they're supposed to. Moses has no voters. Moses has no one that he has to appease because he does not need to be reelected. Moses has gone around our entire democratic system. Now democracy is a, a government under the direct or representative rule of the people or its jurisdiction. So Moses takes that back by drawing power not just from one source, so he has appointments from the state, from the city, and even in one case of the federal government, and being so popular, no mayor, no governor could ever refuse to re not reappoint him. And he becomes a, a country onto himself. I got cut off a little bit, but just a really quick glance. Here are some of the 13 positions that he held, 12 at the same time. As parks commissioner and construction coordinator, he would propose public works projects. And then on the head of the planning commission, he approved the projects that he proposed. <laughs> it, it's only funny because it's so scary. And that this could happen in a democracy, again, reminds us, we're still going here, by the way. <laughs> Some of you can see this at the bottom here. I think that was the last one. Nope, one more. There we go. 52 projects. And there are more too outside of this map. 416 miles of road, almost 700 playgrounds, 150,000 housing units built. He spent in today's dollars $150 billion of public money. Here's another look at some of his projects. Now, these projects as you take a deep dive into any of them, will show the problems that they create. Perhaps none so as great as this right behind me here. This is the construction, of proposed construction, of the Cross Bronx Expressway. You can see the subway hoisted up there. The, the expressway gets gutted through this neighborhood. And you can see how it just approaches, as if some sort of plague approaching 
and en encroaching on a neighborhood. So the tenants in the neighborhood, one neighborhood in particular, East Tremont, where 1,500 homes were slated to be destroyed, they did what you're supposed to do, right? They organized a local community organization. It was headed by someone named Lillian Edelstein, who was like the Jane Jacobs before Jane Jacobs. So they got the controller, their council member, the assembly member, the Manhattan borough president. They all supported them. They organized meetings. They organized rallies. Here you can see one of those. Now, they got support from Robert Wagner, which is important because at the time, Robert Wagner is running for mayor. And he sends a letter, which I want to read to you. And he says, as you know, I have consistently taken the position I will not vote for the acquisition of property for the Cross Bronx Expressway. I want to assure you I will vote against any resolution before the Board of Estimate seeking the authorized acquisition of this property. And then one more time on October 14th, he tells a packed auditorium, I will vote against any resolution. So the day comes, April 23rd, 1953, People take off from work. They come down to the old Board of Estimate, which was downtown and down, not so far from here. And the borough presidents and the mayor gather around a table. And everyone's expecting them to vote a certain way. And there's this clip of Moses. And I was able to screenshot it here. So Moses walks in late. And before he goes to the board, he looks around the room, sort of sneering at people, like, you small, weak people that are going to be in my way. And then he turns around and he whispers into the ear of each member of the Board of Estimate. My question was, well, you probably know the answer. <laughs> so the devastation that follows in the Bronx is the likes of which we've never seen before. People commented it was almost like the reconstruction of the Marshall Plan in Europe because it was so bad. There's a good picture over here. And when you put roads ahead of people, when you make the city more of something you drive through than live in, when that's your priority, this is what you get. And this is what a city looks like. But before things get bad, you have to hit rock bottom. And unfortunately, by 1953, we were far, far from rock bottom in New York. Moses was asked if this was difficult for people, and he responded, oh no, they just stirred up the animals there. So I stood pat, it was easy. There was no more hardship, no real hardship at all. The reason is, the car. The car, in the middle part of the 20th century, the car is democracy, it's freedom. I can get in my car and I can go anywhere I wanna go. I don't have to, wait for the train, they don't tell me what time I leave, I go my way. That was the thinking of the 20th century, that the car is somehow symbolic with our democratic values, and if that's the case, it means we're gonna to toss aside other forms of transportation, and we're going to leave them aside. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. So this is Penn Station, the original. Penn Station. Penn Station, built at the turn of the century, most agree the most grand structure ever built in the United States. To this day, uh, this is actually track 17, so next time you're, this is actually all that's still left. It's still there. Um, not much else is, obviously. So the train station, which was built to last hundreds of years, went about 60. And you can see how grand the halls were, but then when the end came, it was pretty devastating. All for a drab office tower and a team that just lost 18 home games before they <laughs> <laughs> But Penn Station comes down slowly. It's such a hulking piece of monumental architecture. It dies a very, very, very slow death. And eventually it gets hacked to pieces, so this angel here, you can still see uh, most of it was left in a landfill in New Jersey. One of them was saved, and you can see them on um, the 7th Avenue side outside the garden today. It's, you walk past it all the time. Most people don't even notice it, but it's there. There's another one that's at the uh, Hicksville train station on Long Island, and you can see it there. 
So the crumbling of our rails and the disinvestment in our rails has a great impact, but we're building roads, we're building housing, we're building bridges, we're doing public works. So let's go back to the DeWitt Clinton model. If we're building great public works, we should be seeing skyrocket of our population. In 1940, 7.4 million people live in New York. In 1980, it's down to 7 million. This is interesting. This is the first time in 400 years of recorded New York City history that there's been a population drop. Plagues didn't drop the population in New York City. Wars didn't drop the population in New York City. Robert Moses did. So who would stand up against Moses? It's not going to be the media. They were hoodwinked or bought. It's not going to be elected officials. They needed him more than anyone. You can talk about his achievements, but for $150 billion and you've lost population growth, I, I'm not sure what achievements we're really talking about. And so, <laughs> enter to our story. Wish they had a better photo of her like that, but enter into our story, Jane Jacobs. So Jacobs first encounters Robert Moses almost by accident when told that some genius decided to run a highway through Washington Square Park. Now, the idea was twofold. One, alleviate traffic on Fifth Avenue by opening it up, though the buses at the time actually came through the arch to turn around. They don't do that anymore, obviously. But <clears throat> so the idea was, hey, just put a road through there so you can go down south, but not just to alleviate traffic on Fifth Avenue, also to create a passageway to the Lower Manhattan Expressway, which we're going to get to next. So again, the neighborhood began to organize, and Jane Jacobs was part of that organization, and they had these large hearings. At one of those hearings, the head of NYU said, no, this is, this is wrong. The highway you're building is, needs to be wider. <laughs> True story. Now, Jacobs fights against this by enlisting Eleanor Roosevelt and other celebrities. She's one of the first to use celebrity endorsements for political reasons. You have to remember, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, political activism is just starting in this country, mostly because of the Vietnam War as it begins its escalation. Before that, you didn't have protests in the way that you did now. You had riots, and we had riots in the, the Civil War draft riots, but you didn't have this sort of public anger. Jacobs takes her experience and writes Death and Life of Great American Cities, and it's a game changer because she uses her eyes, right? Like urban planners, they use textbooks, they use philosophy, they use graphs. Jane Jacobs uses her eyes. Here's what she says. Cities have the capability of providing something for everyone only because and only when they are created by everybody. There's no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it, and it's to them, not buildings, that we must find our place. Interestingly, she says, dull inert cities, it's true, do contain the seeds of their own destruction and little else, but the lively, diverse, intense cities contain the seeds of their own regeneration with enough energy to carry over for problems and the needs outside themselves. She calls it a ballet. Now, the ballet metaphor, which is very powerful, is that it never repeats itself from place to place, and in any place, it's replete with new improv improvisions. So she looks out on Hudson Street, where she lived, and she sees the butcher who goes out in the morning to get his meats, and the dry cleaner who opens his store, and this is the intricacy of the ballet that makes New York City a great place to live. And when the book comes out, the first review in The New Yorker, Mother Jacob's Home Remedies. This constant misogyny she's up against her entire career. Now she calls it a ballet, but to bring up one of the problems that we have with Jane Jacob's model is like any ballet, there is of course a cost, right? For example, for every biography bookstore, it can suddenly turn into books by Mark Jacobs. <laughs> Who can afford the ballet is the challenge that we live with today. And that's why we need more Jane Jacobs and less Mark Jacobs. <laughs> 
Jacobs, Jane Jacobs, says to us, it's not drugs, it's not crime that kill a city, it's the car. The car is the whole story. The car is what's driving people out of the city. Earlier, when I showed you the Futurama exhibit, guess who sponsored that? General Motors. General Motors is being subsidized thanks to the federal government and state governments who are building more highways for more cars and more highways for more cars, and you're constantly now on that more highway, more car. And all you're doing is driving people out and, by the way, creating more traffic, not solving it. And so Jane Jacobs takes up these fights and begin, it gets personal to her, the next one, because the West Village, which of course is blighted, is declared an urban blighted zone, ur an urban renewal zone by Robert Moses. And so this area over here in the West Village is now going to be home to new housing and high rises. And Jane Jacobs would hear none of it. She organizes again and she's very powerful with visuals. You can see these X's over here. So people were walking around with X's in their glasses and X's on buildings that were going to be destroyed. Again, she lobbies celebrities and well-known people and she uses her experience in the neighborhood to write about, no, this is a better way of living. This is what makes cities great. Because the biggest challenge that would ever face New York in the 20th century is what's coming to Soho. So this is a map of the Lower Manhattan Expressway. So you can imagine an eight-lane highway running through Broom Street. The idea was to alleviate traffic, we're going to connect the Holland Tunnel with the Manhattan and Williamsburg bridges, which sounds great, except you're going to destroy Soho and you're going to put a highway through Lower Manhattan. Now this wasn't the only highway that Moses wanted. He also wanted one in uh, Mid-Manhattan, the Mid-Manhattan Expressway, which would have run across 34th Street. At one point in time, they proposed taking out the 11th and 12th floors of the Empire State Building and running the highway through. <laughs> Don't see any problems with that, by the way. But this, and so because this highway was looming over Soho, the property owners who saw condemnation coming, they never put money into the buildings and the buildings fell apart. And this is what the plan was, and this is how it would have looked, running right through Soho. And planners tried to figure out different ways to cover them up or conceal them. No one could come up with anything really good or appropriate. So Jane Jacobs goes to a hearing. So they're at this public hearing, so DOT has this hearing. So imagine we have commissioners on a stage and y'all are here and you're here ready to fight against the Lower Manhattan Expressway. So the microphone is set up just like this, but facing out, not towards the commissioners. So Jane Jacobs gets up and she turns the mic around and she says, shouldn't, shouldn't I be speaking to you? Meaning the commissioners on stage. So one of the commissioners gets down, he turns the mic around so she can face the stage. And she turns it back and says, I'd rather speak to my friends. <laughs> she then gives this great speech about how stupid, how devastating this highway would be. And she calls on people to take the stage and march in protest. So a bunch, don't do it now though, but a bunch of people get up and they start marching across the stage and there's a stenographer there and she's taking notes and she, the stenographer gets hit and her tape falls all over the floor and there's chaos because now it's not an official meeting because they have no record of it. So they scream, arrest that woman. So Jane Jacobs, sure enough, gets arrested and she's let out in chaos and handcuffs and there's this photo here and there she is <laughs> in prison for speaking. So the highway gets a lot of attention after she gets arrested. And finally, people are waking up to the true devastation. Now we're later on in the 1960s, and we're understanding that something is not happening right in this city. Assemblyman Luis de Salvo had said, except for one old man, I've been unable to find anyone of technical competence who is for this so-called expressway. And this old man is a cantankerous, stubborn old man who has done many good things and in their time have been good for the city but I think it is time for this stubborn old man to realize that too many of his dreams turn into nightmares for the city. And this board must realize if it does not kill 
this stupid example of bad city planning that the stench of it will haunt them in this great city for years to come. And after that and after this, the Lower Manhattan Expressway was soundly defeated. And the defeat leads to others, and eventually, 1968 comes around, Governor Nelson Rockefeller sees a chance to consolidate power and take Moses out entirely. And so he says, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna form this new organization. It's gonna be great. We're gonna take all of our mass transit, put it into one organization, we're gonna take out Moses, and it'll be efficient, it'll be smart, it'll be great. That, M that organization is the MTA, which is a state agency responsible for our local transportation. It means state senators in Oswego have more say than the member of your city council. And the reason I call Robert Moses our point of original sin is this would never have happened had Moses not been in power. And so we were left with the MTA, but the other reason we gather here tonight while this is an important conversation is because the Moses story tells us how fragile our democracy is. Because if you think that our democracy is so strong that it can sustain anyone who would dare to subvert it, I say to you, <laughs> Think again. That's why this story is so, yeah, look, it looks terrible. That's why this story is so important. And I implore all of you to remember that all of our democracy is local. And it's up to each of us to ensure that the lessons of the past don't repeat itself at the local, at the state, or at the federal level because it's happening and it will happen again. People have asked me if I could sum up what I think about Robert Moses in one sentence, which would have saved us a whole lot of time, I suppose. But I, I can, and it's this. New York needed a Robert Moses. Instead, we got the Robert Moses. In other words, the, we did need to modernize the city. I mean, the, the roads were for horses. Um, we didn't have uh, an efficient mass transit system. Still don't. But instead of getting someone who would think about the people they represent and about the best way forward for the future and for the city, we had someone who was power hungry and cared about himself and making himself an emperor of Rome, remembered forever through his great works. But instead, all we are now is left to say what might have been, because all we know is New York would have been a different place, not the same. But it's up to us, like Jane Jacobs said, we expect too much of new buildings and too little of ourselves. So I leave tonight with this. Let's commit ourselves to thinking more of ourselves, less of our buildings, and more smartly about our future. Thank you very much for coming out tonight, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you.